The 6 o'clock news starts right now. Construction projects all around San Antonio have posed a challenge to businesses. Yeah. Well, now businesses in 15 construction corridors will have a chance to get some financial help. The San Antonio City Manager approved the COVID Construction Recovery Grant Program. Our John Paul Barajas at City Council, he joins us live. John Paul, a lot of questions about just how this program will work. That's correct. The city has approved roughly $2 million from the American Rescue Plan Act to be allocated for direct grants. Now, businesses can receive a maximum of $35,000, a minimum of $10,000. But if you are a business that has previously received funds from the COVID-19 impact fund, you will be capped on how much funding you're eligible for. Those that are eligible have had to have construction start in their area between January 1st of 2020 and June 30th of 2022. You must be a retailer service business that is dependent on in-person traffic, and you must be considered a small business by the standards of the North American Industry Classification System. Currently, as mentioned, 15 different construction corridors have been identified. Councilman Mario Bravo has at least two construction projects in his district, the Broadway Street Corridor and the North St. Mary Strip. This is what he had to say. We heard from some of them is, hey, you know what, 35,000 isn't enough. And I heard that from somebody who's lost a million dollars. This is not going to make anybody whole, but my number one priority is to make sure, and this is echoing what, what Councilman McKee Rodriguez was talking about, is we want to make sure that nobody goes out of business. Now, the main two questions businesses were asking was, is the assistance going to be enough? And is everybody who is applicable going to receive the assistance? Coming up at 10, we'll hear from those businesses as they have more concerns. At City Hall, John Paul Barajas, KSAT 12 News. Thank you, John Paul. A potential carbon monoxide leak at the Hotel Emma has sent 15 people to the hospital, hundreds of guests waiting to go back inside San Antonio Fire, CPS Energy, working to find the cause of that leak before people can return into the building, which is the heart of the Pearl District. Our Camelia Juarez has been following this. Camelia, do we have any idea when guests can return to their room or are they gonna be returning? Well, Steve, we do know that it's unclear when they can go back inside, but guests have been relocated to somewhere else. We just got that update about 10 minutes ago. But San Antonio Fire says no one can go inside that building until they've identified that leak and then repaired it. San Antonio Fire says they got the call around 11 for someone with a headache and nausea. And when firefighters arrived, more people expressed similar symptoms. 15 people, mostly hotel employees, were taken to the hospital as a precaution. The gas leak is isolated to one or two floors in the hotel. San Antonio Fire spokesperson Joe Arrington says fire crews are working to clear the hotel and repair the gas leak. I heard our, our hazmat officer saying that initial readings, what they got, have drastically dropped. So the airing it out, opening up the windows, getting it aired out is working. So it's, it's going to be a slow process. It's one where you, you don't mess around with it. It's not something you, uh, you do halfway. You know, you want to make sure you get it all aired out and, and repaired properly so we don't put anyone in danger. Now we asked Hotel Emma if the hotel has carbon monoxide detectors and what will happen to guests if they don't find that leak tonight. As we said earlier, they did say that those guests have been relocated and they did give us a statement. They said, we thank SAFD for their quick response and we look forward to resolving this issue in a safe and timely manner. The safety and comfort of our guests and staff remains our top priority. We're watching the situation closely and we will share updates as they occur. And as a precaution, a restaurant nearby was uh, evacuated as well, but it opened about a couple hours ago. As we learn more and we get more updates, we'll let you know on air and on live. Reporting live from the Pearl, Camelia Juarez, KSAT 12 News. All right, Camelia, thank you. Despite being charged with a DWI in a hit and run crash, Northside Councilman Clayton Perry is expected to return to the San Antonio City Council tomorrow. Perry took a leave of absence from his role as the District 10 Councilman on November 14th, just over a week after a head on crash and a few days after he was booked for failure to stop and provide information. His fellow council members at that time passed a vote of no confidence in Perry, but a majority of them scrapped a call for him to resign. However, that call came before he officially faced a DWI charge and was accused of having 14 drinks in four hours ahead of that crash.
I feel at the time it was the appropriate thing to do. We're supposed to act on whatever information we have at the time. And so as new information came out, you know, we were on break. So there's not much that we can do um, over the break without talking to everybody else. So um, I'm interested to see what my colleagues uh, will, um, will be looking forward to learning more about today and tomorrow. In a letter to city officials today, Perry wrote, quote, I assert that I have sufficiently addressed the issues that prevented me from carrying out my duties as a council member, end quote. We now know the name of a couple killed in a deadly shooting last Friday. According to the Bear County Medical Examiner, 34-year-old Xavier Lopez and 38-year-old Janelle Lopez killed in West Bear County. The Bear County Sheriff's Office says that shooting happened about 9.30 p.m. in the 7,000 block of Calle Fincias. Both of them were pronounced dead at the scene. The shooter still has not been identified. Anyone with information asked to call BCSO at 210-335-6000. New name, same old strategy. A convicted thief with a long rap sheet has apparently struck again. This time convincing would be clients in the San Antonio area to pay him up front for woodwork before then disappearing. Case that investigates Dylan Collier on the latest trail of victims left behind. Come on, Kita. Land to run around and play, but also security. After buying two plots of land on the southwest side of Canyon Lake last spring, Tish Pulsifer quickly realized she would need a privacy fence. She started by searching uh, Craigslist San Antonio, which I will not do again. <laughs> After leaving a message for American Eagle fencing, a man who referred to himself as RJ soon called her back. And said they are ready to start. So excited. We're going to start right now. The contract, which included a misspelled Bible chapter encouraging people to follow God's example, was for just under $14,000 after Pulsifer got a discount for paying up front. What emerged in the weeks and months that followed was one red flag after another. Attempts to pay RJ through Cash App were repeatedly rejected, labeled as suspicious. Pulsifer ended up having to write him a check made out to a different man, which was ultimately cashed in Houston. RJ then didn't show up at her property for months and only sent a crew in mid-July after Pulsifer said she threatened to report him to the sheriff's office. Still owed money from RJ for a previous job, those workers installed a handful of posts, then got upset after they learned Pulsifer had paid for her fence months ago. And they walked off. That's the last contact Pulsifer had with RJ. She hired a private investigator to help find him and soon realized who she had been dealing with. Is this the man who uh, came up and got the yes. check? RJ is actually Taylor McKimberly, a prior defendant in 10 theft cases in Bear County alone. He spent nearly two years in prison after pleading no contest to stealing funds from a West Side church before getting out in the summer of 2018. His exploits so large in number that he now has his own Facebook page, Scammers of San Antonio. McKimberly did not respond to requests for comment, left at the last two residences associated with him. His listed business address is this empty car lot on the northeast side. Who used my property as a Duncan Brown. Its owner told KSAT McKimberly approached him about setting up his operations there in exchange for cleaning up the property. Instead, the owner says McKimberly turned it into a dump and then took off. It cost the man $8,000 to clean up the mess left behind. So, have a bit. For Pulsifer, she hopes law enforcement can fit together all the pieces of the puzzle. How do you prosecute a guy named RJ with no address, no legal name? For Case That Investigates, I'm Dylan Collier. Pulsifer filed a theft complaint against McKimberly with the Comal County Sheriff's Office last month. San Antonio police received a similar theft complaint about him in late September. He's not been charged with a crime in Bear County since his 2018 release from prison. Check out Trans Guide right now. Let's go to the west side. This is 410 in Ingram, and you can see that things are moving along pretty smoothly out there. Heavy traffic, though, in both directions. No major traffic tie-ups, though, to tell you about at this hour, which is good news. Well, new at six, thousands of visitors in San Antonio this week looking to shape the future of college athletics. The NCAA 
hosting its annual member convention at the Henry B. Gonzalez Convention Center. RJ Marquez tells us what economic impact this event is expected to have and why it could lead to bigger and better things down the road. It's game on in downtown San Antonio as the NCAA convention is back after more than a decade. It's an opportunity to get back in front of the NCAA, nurture those relationships and talk about future business. Jenny Carnes with San Antonio Sports says that future business means continuing to secure high profile NCAA events for the city. With the NCAA, it always starts with the final fours for us. We've got the men's on the books for 2025. We were just awarded another women's, which will be back here in 2029. With thousands of NCAA members in town, it's also a for the local tourism industry. It's a great convention. The association um, brings 9,000 room nights. That's around uh, that's around 3,000 conventioneers that stay for three nights. Andres Munoz with Visit San Antonio says this week's convention is bringing in millions of dollars in economic impact and an opportunity to show why San Antonio deserves to host events in the future. The meeting specifically is uh, has a probably an economic impact calculated around three and a half million dollars. It's about understanding from them what we need to continue to do to make sure that the final fours return past what we already have on the calendar. Um, and then looking at some of the other championships. San Antonio sports would like to bring volleyball back and potentially even the Frozen Four, hockey's version of the Final Four, but it all starts at conventions like this. We're open for business anytime they want to come. This is the first full in-person NCAA convention since 2020 and the first one being held here in San Antonio since 2011. It will run through this Saturday here at the Gonzalez Convention Center. RJ Marquez, KSAT 12 News. Take a look outside this evening, another warm January day, but now we're waiting on that cold front, Adam. Yeah, that cold front's on the way. It's going to get here around midnight, and there will be some noticeable changes with it. It's going to reset us back near average for this time of year. I mean, how's this for January? 80s across a good chunk of Texas. 86 Junction, Del Rio, high temperature of 87. Check out Catula, a high today of 91. Carrizo Springs topped out at 90. Now this evening, right now we're in the 70s. We'll fall through the 60s. Not much of a breeze, a quiet evening. Even when the front hits at midnight, it's not going to be all that noticeable immediately. Morning temperatures tomorrow in the 50s, 53 in San Antonio. But notice we dip down into the 30s, but 30s above freezing by Friday and Saturday mornings. That'll be the coldest we get from this cold front. We'll be back to talk about afternoon temperatures and especially how gusty the wind's going to be and how long it'll last behind this front in just a bit. Welcome back. I'm Stefania Jimenez, and here's what we're working on for you tonight on the Night Beat. It's unfortunate because it's happening at a time when travel is really booming again or trying to come back from the pandemic. Yeah, we've all heard about the messes really at airports, but how about preparing for them? As thousands of passengers are delayed yet again, what travelers can do before they get caught in the chaos. Also, we know this, everything seems to be getting more expensive these days, especially eggs. But do you know why? Well, we have the story behind the shortage that's driving up costs and why those high prices aren't flying the coop anytime soon. We'll see you for these stories and more tonight on The Night Beat. Thanks, Stephanie. The best in the nation. That is the news from University Health about their living donor kidney transplant program for kids. Courtney Friedman talked to the program leaders and a transplant recipient about what makes this program number one. About a year ago, 14 year old Gwen De Leon started feeling sick. They said, hey, it's your kidneys. Go to the hospital like right now. She was in kidney failure and went immediately on dialysis. It's just part of the process. Um, They knew immediately that she would be needing a kidney transplant. Gwen's father, Jeremy DeLeon, said seven months into dialysis, they joined University Health's Champion for Life program. A living donor champion is really an ambassador for the patient to help educate others and to help identify a living donor. Renowned surgeon Dr. Francisco Cigarroa directs the University Health Transplant Institute and says the new program finds patients a champion who is trained to help find them a living kidney donor, offering a much better success rate and shorter time on dialysis. Living in such a small town where it gets out really fast. The town of Divine rallied around Gwen and over 100 people got on the living donor list. Gwen found a match and had the successful transplant November 17th. I was feeling so happy that I cried and I was like, I'm off this machine. I like I can 
I can breathe. And Gwen wasn't the only success story at University Health in 2022. Closing out the year, the team had performed more pediatric kidney transplants with organs from living donors than any other transplant program in the country. Just under 60% of all of the pediatric transplants we did were living donors. Dr. Jennifer Milton is the Transplant Institute's chief administrator and says they're now taking the show on the road. We present at Grand Rounds. We present at other transplant programs at national conferences. Getting more living donors to step up and save lives like Gwen's. I would also encourage people who can to donate because I'm thankful for mine. Courtney Friedman, KSAT 12 News. Now, if you want to register to be a living donor, head to University Health's donation website. You can find that link on KSAT.com. Just look for this story. Check out Sky 12 right now and we're over the convention center. the convention center appropriately with the ncaa convention in town and if people are thinking oh wow 70s this is great this is going to be what it's like in san antonio mm, a little on. bit of a drop off yeah we'll have a drop off it's not going to be as drastic as previous cold fronts this season but you'll notice the change and really it's going to reset us back to near average for this time of year and if we have any visitors in town if you're sniffling and sneezing Welcome to Mountain Cedar season here in South and Central Texas. Today, 78 degrees are high temperature. That's well above the average of 63, but shy of the record of 84. Now notice our high temperatures going forward back down into the 60s tomorrow, Friday, and Saturday. The average high is 63 we will be a little above that, but still this is back to what's more like reality this time of year. And then we warm back up again by Sunday and even on into Monday. All right, let's take a look at the wind because this is what's going to be noticeable. Notice off into North Texas and even parts of West Texas. The wind is starting to pick up. That's behind the cold front. Lubbock right now, a steady wind at 31 miles per hour. Amarillo, a steady wind at 20. That gusty wind is going to be headed our way, and you're going to notice it first thing tomorrow morning. Here's our future cast for the sustained wind. This is not gusts. This is just steady wind. And by 7 a.m., about 15 miles per hour. We get to 11 a.m., and we'll likely have a steady wind out of the north around 20 miles per hour. That, of course, means higher gusts. And the wind's going to remain howling tomorrow up until after sunset, and especially 9, 10 p.m., that's when it starts to simmer down more. When you want to talk about the gusts, we're thinking 30 to 35 miles per hour, especially the first half of the day tomorrow. Uh, this model is saying up to 38, 39 miles per hour. Not out of the question, but we're thinking most, mostly up around 35 at times. In the hill country, you could see some even higher gusts than that. Those gusts do simmer down after sunset tomorrow and especially tomorrow night. North wind this time of year never really bodes well for the mountain cedar count. Today it was high at over 4,700. The wind's going to be out of the north tomorrow and even Friday. Friday just not as gusty. You're not going to notice it as much, but still we'll have that northerly component to the wind, a gentle north wind. So the north wind will likely to boost that mountain cedar count in the next over the next couple of days and last for a few days from that higher concentration of cedar trees up in the hill country. All right, here's the big picture weather wise. You see a little swirl here it's moving from Colorado into Kansas. That's an upper level low pressure system that's staying to the north of us. All the good precipitation it's going to be making. That's going to stay east of our area. Unfortunately, it's going to stir up more showers, but just not for us. We're going to remain high and dry around here. Nothing but sunshine tomorrow. 53 at 7 a.m. by noon up to 62, then a high of 66 at 4 o'clock with those gusts up to 35 miles per hour. Notice the coldest mornings Friday down to 38, Saturday down to 35. That's as cold as we'll be, though, around here, and we're back into the 70s by Sunday. All right, thank you, Adam. All right, it seems like the season just got started. Yeah. <laughs> but the Spurs are kicking off the second half of the NBA season tonight, Larry. And it's fun to watch them getting better each yeah. and every game. They're not getting the results they want, of course, but the Spurs are kicking off the second half of the season knowing that they are a very tough, gritty team, and that's certainly becoming their identity. And J.J. Watt was moved to tears on Sunday. Coming up. Spurs 
will try to knock off the Grizzlies for the first time this season when they face them at the FedEx Forum tonight. Memphis won 121-113 on Monday night and lead the season series two games to none. Grizzlies star guard Ja Morant, who sat Monday with a sore right thigh, is not listed on the Grizzlies' injury report tonight. Now the Spurs fought back from a 13-point second quarter hole Monday to lead by five in the fourth, only to lose. Something that we have to do to give ourselves a chance um, every single night, um, but it's something that you know we want to build on as well. Uh, we don't want to be a team that you know just depends on you know making shots and trying to play pretty and, and doing things like that. We want to you know be in there getting ugly, um, you know trying to be the team that plays harder every single night for all 48 as well. Here's the matchup for you: Memphis will host San Antonio tonight at seven. Pro Football Government, powered by Davis Law Firm. Buffalo Bills safety Namar Hamlin was discharged from a Buffalo hospital this morning nine days after he suffered a cardiac arrest during the first quarter of Monday Night Football between the Bills and the Bengals. He was flown from Cincinnati to Buffalo on Monday where he passed a series of health tests and now he's able to continue his rehab at home and with the Bills. Grateful first and foremost that he's home and uh, with his parents and, and his brother, which is great. Um, I'm sure it's felt like a long time since he's been able to be home naturally there, and uh, I'm sure it's a great feeling. And yeah, we'll we'll leave it up to him. You know, his health is first and foremost on our mind as far as his situation goes. And then uh, when he feels ready, um, you know, we welcome him back as uh, as he feels ready. The Dallas Cowboys are getting ready to play at the Tampa Bay Buccaneers as part of Super Wild Card Weekend Monday night at 7.15 right here on KSAT 12. Cowboys defensive lineman Demarcus Lawrence was asked why is seven-time Super Bowl champion Tom Brady so good in the clutch? I feel like, you know, in those situations, like, he can get his team ready, hurry him up to the ball and call his own plays because he, he know what type of defenses and stuff he's going to be facing. So, um, you know, respect Tom Brady, you know, but at the end of the day, you know, we got to do our job. Tampa Bay won the AFC South at 8-9 for Brady's first losing season as a starting quarterback. His leading receiver, Mike Evans, ready to face the Cowboys passing defense that finished ninth overall in passing yards allowed. And before J.J. Watt's final game in the NFL last Sunday, the Arizona Cardinals played him a special tribute video that brought him to tears. Here's part of that clip that will air tonight on HBO Hard Knocks. They're down at corner. They got two guys injured. Um, that were some solid players. The, the, the backup is, is solid. We're watching more film on him, uh, 26. Um, he's made some plays, but um, you know when we're, when we're healthy, it doesn't matter who the DBs are. So hopefully, hopefully we get a lot of cover one. Uh, you know, I love that. Our apologies for that. Somehow our video got out of order. Evans had 71 yards receiving and one touchdown in the Bucks, 19 to three week one win at Dallas. And are we going to have that JJ sound? Hopefully we have it coming up. Brother, JJ, I just want to say congratulations on retirement. Um, you and your resiliency throughout all the ups and downs, you ending up in the NFL and you being a defensive player of the year and you having all the success that you had showed me that it's possible. Congratulations, buddy. See you in camp. You're an incredible player. Excited to see the next chapter of your life. Good luck, brother. Congrats on your retirement and Hall of Fame career, Jage. It's been so special having a front row seat to it all and I couldn't be more proud of you. Love you, bro. His wife and both of his parents are also part of that video, and he cried a lot, which was I obviously awesome. did not expect it. He did not. It surprised him. Yeah, the NFL is going to miss him. They will. Yeah. Thanks, Larry. Well, former Uvalde CISD Police Chief Pete Arredondo still not talking about what happened during the catastrophic response to the deadly shooting at Robb Elementary, but he did talk the day after the shooting. Yeah, what he said to investigators about that response or lack of it, and what body cam shows actually happened during that response. The full story is next. For the first time, the former Uvalde School District Police Chief, in his own words, talking about the decisions he made the day of the Robb Elementary School shooting. CNN got video of the interview with Pete Arredondo. It was recorded the morning after that shooting, with Arredondo speaking to the FBI and Texas Rangers. CNN's Shimon Praukopez takes a closer look. 
I know there was probably victims in there. And with the shots I heard, I, I know it's probably somebody who's going to be deceased. Former Uvalde School Police Chief Pete Arredondo heard for the first time. Careful, Chief. Come on, come on. The day after the May 24th shooting, attempting to explain his actions. In new video obtained by CNN, Arredondo telling investigators he assumed students in the room with the shooter were already dead. So he chose to clear children from surrounding classrooms. There's nobody in there? No, not here. He's clear. We now know he was wrong. At least three victims were pulled out of the room alive, who later died from their injuries. My first thought is that we need to we need to vacate. We haven't been we haven't contained, and I know this is horrible. I know this is what our training tells us to do, but we haven't contained. There's probably gonna be some deceased in there, but we don't need any more from out here. So I called out and I said, "Get these kids out." Okay, baby, Whatever I told them, bust those windows, get them out. Stunning admissions while being questioned by the FBI and Texas Rangers. Uh, Throughout this deal, I was trying to get make communication with him. He's, he's communicating. Can you hear me, sir? Arredondo explains he kept trying to talk to the shooter, and for the first time, we learned that he heard the gunman, alone in a room full of children, reloading his weapon. And still, he took no action that stopped the gunman. I'm certain I heard him reload. I, I heard something with a pin. You obviously we all know what that sounds like. Uh, not with a pin, I'm sorry, with a, with a clip. I'm assuming he reloaded, but I know he did something with it. Uh, I did hear that at one time. I don't know if it, there was a second. Um, he never responded at all. I'm going to go around that way or, what, or which way? Now considered one of the worst law enforcement failures in recent memory, Arredondo knew that criticism would come. We're going to get scrutinized. I'm expecting that. Uh, we're going to get scrutinized. Why we didn't go in there? Days later, Arredondo would be labeled the incident commander by the Texas State Police. They say he was the officer in charge and the man to blame for the deadly delay. Who was the incident commander, sir? The chief of police of the Consolidated Independent School District is the incident commander. Hey, it's his school. He's the chief of police. Okay. Arredondo, who presided over a six-person police force before he was terminated in August, declined to comment for this story. Through his lawyer, he has previously denied that he was ever in charge and said he never issued any orders. A CNN analysis of never-before-made public body camera footage and newly obtained phone calls reveal Arredondo repeatedly directed the officers around him not to enter the room with the gunman. This is at 11.40 a.m., just seven minutes after the shooting began. Hey, hey, this is Arredondo. This is an emergency right now. I'm inside the building. I'm inside the building with this man. He has an AR-15. He shot a whole bunch of times. He is in one room. I need a lot of firepower, so I need this building surrounded. And he's surrounded with as many AR-15s as possible. As more officers with body cameras responded to the scene, we can hear Arredondo start to talk to the shooter. Sir, this is Arredondo. Police, can you please put your firearm down? We don't want anyone else hurt, sir. Arredondo can be seen trying to open the door to an adjacent classroom while giving commands to other officers. We're, we're going to clear out before we, before we do any breach. We're going to clear out these guys. And since I clear this room, I'm going to verify what's been vacated, guys, before we do any kind of breaching. Time's on our side right now. Time was not on his side, and it reflects a mindset that goes directly against active shooter training. The policy emphasizes speed for any officer to go immediately towards the sound of gunfire and stop the shooter. Arredondo last completed the training in December 2021, five months before the Uvalde massacre. At about 12, 12 p.m., a crucial transmission from the Uvalde dispatcher comes over the radios in the hallway, informing the officers that a child in the room with the gunman called 911 and says she's surrounded by victims. The dispatch blares with an earshot of Arredondo. He doesn't seem to hear it because he's talking, repeating instructions for officers not to enter. Hey guys, hold on. We're going to clear the building first, and then we'll attack the officers actually turn down their radios so they can hear Arredondo give the order. Actually, turn the radios down, please. It seems clear to the men on this side of the hallway Arredondo is in charge. No 
entry so the chief of police gives you permission there. And when a nearby officer suggests that a border patrol agent looks like they are about to go in. You ready for friendlies? No, wait, no, nobody no, entry. Arredondo said he assumed border patrol agents at the other end of the hallway would be the ones to make the breach, since they had rifles and he and his men only had pistols. Uh, so I know those are BP and I know those are probably Bortac. Uh, smart thing for us to do, obviously with a handgun, is we need to let these guys uh, make entry when that's, it's, it's that time. I gotta go over <laughs> But it wasn't just handguns. As body camera footage clearly shows, there were plenty of heavily armed officers on scene. Hey, some in the very first moments after the shooting began. Arredondo, for the first time, also explaining why he thought the door was locked, admitting he never tried to open it. I have it in my, my picture in my mind that I saw that. I saw that hammer in there. And usually when that's there, that's locked. Man, 90% of the time. Three, two, three, four, eight, one of these, we now know investigators believe it was unlocked and there was no need to wait for a key. At the end of the interview, Arredondo says that rather than breaching the door, he even considered trying to shoot through the walls to kill the gunman. The thought crossed my mind to start shooting through that wall, which has been stupid, but you, you start thinking, there's already somebody deceased in there uh, you want to start, but you know, obviously we, we don't ever train to shoot through walls. It's not something that, uh, it's not probably the smartest idea, but you know, you always question yourself. Shimon Prokopes, CNN, Uvalde, Texas. You can find a link to the full interview video, all 57 minutes of it, on KSAT.com. Just look for this story. We'll be right back.